now it's time to talk about my mother as a mother, a young mother. Uh, um, I know why you're all here. You're here because when my mother would talk to you, whether it's at a table or a cocktail party or her house, you were the only one who existed. She made you feel like a million bucks. And that was her secret power. <laughs> Sorry. Her secret power was the ability to make you feel as loved as we all need to be. Now imagine that kind of love bestowed on you every single day of your childhood and you have a taste of what it was like to have my mother as my mom. Uh, um, it wasn't always easy. It was, <laughs> she was starting uh, uh, as a 19 year old mother and when I was born apparently I had a very worried look on my face when I was born. <laughs> and she looked at me and she felt compelled to say, I'm going to make a great life for us. And boy, did she ace that one. But the, uh, uh, to a certain degree, I have to say, this is very weird playing to a wall. So <laughs> just acknowledging that. Uh, um, but she, uh, she and I, in many respects, raised each other. Um, there were times where I was her confidant. I was her best friend. Uh, uh, I every once in a while was the parent. Uh, um, there was one time, uh, because we weren't, we weren't really, well, we were poor. <laughs> and uh, um, my mother, I think this is the first time she really like started her salesmanship. She sold me on a potato. And the reason why she sold me on a potato is because that's all that we had for dinner. But boy, my mom, baked that potato and mashed it up inside and smothered it in butter and she had a little chive garden on the windowsill and she cut up chives on it and a little dollop of sour cream. And I had no idea we were poor. We were happy. And for the first eight years of my life, I had my mom to myself. It was the two of us against the world. Uh, um, there, there was one time where I did have to be her protector uh, um, I didn't realize it at the time, but she hadn't paid the wallpaper guy. And so the wallpaper guy comes to the door and he starts pushing my mom around. And I'm six years old and I didn't want that to happen. So I uh, punched him. Well, when you're six years old, I punched him right in the nuts. You know what? He deserved it. The jerk. Uh, um, but the bond between my mother and I, I is indescribable. Um, it's one of those things I know. I know she broke the cardinal rule. Many people tonight have come up to me and they said, oh, I used to talk to your mother about you for hours. I'm sorry. <laughs> she, uh, um, she really did love me. Uh, um, and Everyone in our family, all our friends and family was aware of this unique bond that my mother and I had. Uh, um, and there are even strangers who would pick up on it. There was a restaurant in Sausalito, which is where we moved uh, uh, to get out of the city, where all the faux hippies were living at the time. And uh, um, my mother, who should have been paying rent, got paid for some modeling job. And she said, it's your birthday. It was my seventh, seventh birthday. Where do you want to go? I want to take you to dinner. And I sort of sheepishly said, can we go to Skoma's? Skoma's is a seafood restaurant, you know it, in San Francisco. And we go to Skoma's, and my mother, I can see her counting her money underneath the table. And we order two dozen clams each. And the butter is dripping off of our chin. And you know when you take the bread and you dip it in, and you've seen how incredible it is when someone's really enjoying their meal. And then uh, we were done and my mom said, do you want another dozen? So we got another dozen clams. And then the cheesecake came out with one candle in it and the restaurant saying happy birthday. And my mother was dreading a little, but she knew it was time to pay the piper. And she asked the waitress, can I have the check? And the waitress said, there was a man over there and he said he'd never seen two people 
enjoy their meal as much as the two of you. And he paid for it. And we walked outside. My mother was thinking, ah, no, I'm going to get hit on. <laughs> but the truth is, this man is just some angel. He disappeared. He was truly just wanted to pay it forward. And, you know, I, everyone here knows my mom as Suzanne Summers. But the reality is, is that to me, she wasn't Suzanne Summers. She wasn't a best-selling author. She wasn't a sitcom star. She wasn't a fitness guru. She wasn't the icon and the legend that we all know her to be. <sighs> She's just my mom. <laughs> and she loved being my mother. And I am the luckiest man on earth. A little shorter than I thought it would be, but I got the most amazing years and the most amazing mother who taught me how to love, who taught me how to love others, love myself, have compassion, have empathy, always remember where you came from, and be kind, be kind to everyone. So after the end of, after eight years wasn't the end, uh, um, there was someone else who came into our life, a new protector. Uh, um, and it was a love affair that only fairy tales are made from. And that's when Alan came into our life and my mom and Alan fell in love. So I want to introduce Alan Hamill. And I want everyone to know that everything that we've experienced would not be possible without my mother and Alan. Um, I am eternally grateful. We've had a wonderfully, humorously, antagonistic relationship. And I love him dearly. And he's going to speak some words here. Alan. Well, I'm a friggin' mess. So I just wanted to tell you that in 1968, I think it was, or 69, I was uh, doing a show for ABC. We were shooting in San Francisco. And I was uh, giving notes to the crew. And across the stage was the most incredible, beautiful, girl woman I have ever seen in my life and I thought I have to go talk to her but uh, I was very bad with come on lines really bad and so on the way over I panicked a little bit because I didn't know what I was going to say and for good reason because when I got there I said would you mind getting me a cup of coffee now, today I'd be in prison for that. <laughs> but that was the beginning. And we both knew it. And we started making life plans long before we started living our life plans. And Suzanne said to me, we have two families, and I want to bring both families together. I want us to have one magnificent family. And I thought, that's a tough thing to do, bringing two families together. And she did it. And we have one magnificent family today, and I'm so proud of all of them, really. And I love being with them. How many people can say they love being with their family? Yeah. Anyway, I, um, I'd like to read a poem that I wrote to Suzanne, and I read this to her before she passed. 
I had I have written a lot of love letters to Suzanne over the years, and she's hidden them away in some little trunk somewhere. So here's the most current one. Love. There is no version of the word love that is applicable to Suzanne. The closest version in words isn't even close. It's not even a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. Unconditional love does not do it. I'll take a bullet for you doesn't do it. I weep when I think about my feelings for you. Doesn't do it. Feelings. Feelings, that's getting close, but not all the way. 55 years together, 46 married, and not even one hour apart for 42 of those years. And even that doesn't do it. Even going to bed at 6 o'clock and holding hands while we sleep doesn't do it. Staring at your beautiful face while you sleep doesn't do it. And back to feelings. There are no words, there are no actions, no promises, no declarations. I am, uh, I am deeply in love with you, my beautiful Suzanne, for all of eternity. And we are one. Thank you. So next is one of Suzanne's granddaughters, one of her mini-me's, Camelia Summers, my daughter, my oldest daughter. Hello, everyone. Is this, all? this is weird, this rock situation. So Zanny was the first person to ever meet me, which is a recollection that my mom often argues after growing me for nine months, but I'm sure she'll now let it slide. Um, but our first meeting was probably one of Zanny's favorite stories to tell. Um, my mother birthed me cesarean, and the doctor went over to my grandmother, and she said, and he said, Suzanne, would you like to meet your granddaughter? And she stuck out her index finger, and I was still halfway in my mom's stomach, and she put her finger out, and I went like this, and that was the first time we met, and she was the first person to meet me, and we've been connected ever since. Um, but Zanny, she was always wearing, as you all know, because you are all dressed like this tonight, but she was always wearing some combination of leopard print, cashmere, sparkles, a heeled shoe, even her slippers had wedges on them, um, blue eyeliner, and the most exquisite jewelry that I had ever seen. And if I would compliment any part of it, or if any of us grandchildren would compliment anything, she would always lean in, and she'd have this unassuming smirk, and she'd say, well... I'm a different kind of grandma, and she was. <laughs> but it wasn't just because she wore Daisy Dukes and mini dresses. It was because of her ability to make every single person in a room feel like they were the most special one. And it was how she was cherished by friends and family and strangers alike. It was how she loved love and always said it that way. Um, but she had reason to after her 50 plus year relationship with Zeta. And it was how she cooked a third, sorry, it was how she cooked three hot meals for all 13 members of our family every single time she hosted us in Palm Springs. And it was specifically her perfect roast chicken, which would then become the perfect stock for chicken soup. It was her labor of love when she would chop and a ch chop and fry crispy shallots, and my mom never lets us sneak it from the pan because it's too much work, but Zanny always let us sneak it from the pan. It was her daily five o'clock tequila, which she drank straight and with one large ice cube in a glass that is more fit to be called a bowl. <laughs> and she would always say, but I only ever have one. <laughs> it was her meticulous attention to detail how she set a table with antique lace linens from her travels in France with these beautiful green Baccarat glasses and the most beautiful sterling silver flatware and handwritten place cards. It was her love of cake, any cake. You could buy it anywhere, literally anywhere. She would still have three plates. It was her hatred of games and numbers, hated math, 
not good at it, and anything sports related. It was her perfectly manicured hands on which she always had a layer of foundation to hide her sunspots, but I loved her sunspots. Um, I don't know why that's making me cry. <laughs> Um, it was her beautiful handwriting, and the way that she wrapped every gift with so much satin ribbon that the gift itself kind of became the ribbon. Um, it was her iconic blonde bangs. It was her snort that came out during a really, really good laugh. It was how if she really liked something, she'd describe it as bitchin'. It was always bitchin' cool. Um, it was how she belted along to jazz, and she never really knew the lyrics, so it kind of sang in more of an echo. She'd be cooking, and then you'd just hear out of the blue, like, you. <laughs> yes, Annie, go, go off. Um, it was how she was a pioneer, and how she stood up for women's rights when she asked for equal pay on Three's Company. It was how she then repeatedly reinvented her career after every roadblock, of which there were many. It was how she was a warrior and how she beat cancer so many fucking times and then researched and interviewed the best doctors to make sure that other people could also beat cancer. It was mostly just how she celebrated life and how we will all continue to celebrate hers for the rest of ours. So from that very first moment that I was brought into the world, I had that connection with Zanny, and she'd always look at me and she'd say, it's you and me, baby. It's, it's always been this, and it was always the fingers. And at her burial last month, I was craving that one final connection. And as a prayer was being read and her casket was lowered into the ground, I ran over and I stopped the men from lowering the casket and I put both hands on it and I said my final goodbye. And it only felt right that because she was the first person in the world to touch me. I got to be the last to touch her. So I love you, Sandy. Thank you for everything. Next is, are you okay? Are you ready? <laughs> is my younger daughter, Violet Summers. Starting off on a really teary note already. <laughs> uh, I was up all night last night trying to find the words to describe a woman who is everything. I can only conclude that words will never touch the depths of this woman. I miss her tremendously, um, but though I miss her, I do feel that we've been discovering a new relationship, that of a uh, metaphysical nature and I feel her guiding me, I feel her with me, I feel her with all of us in this, in this space right now. The main lesson, I mean, there are countless things she's taught me over the years, but what's standing out to me right now is how she taught me, how she always encouraged to dream big. I, like my Zanny, have always been a dreamer. My dreams have always felt embarrassing, <laughs> as dreams are. They're big, they're sparkly, they're grand. Perhaps the sparkle in my grandmother's eye invited me to keep going. My childhood was spent visiting Zanny and Zeta in Palm Springs for Thanksgiving, and the house was this beautiful vortex of magic in the middle of the mountains in Palm Springs, and uh, we would play a game called Mrs. Summers on the wooden playground, and. We'd uh, eat the best turkey of our lives with all the juices dripping over potatoes and, uh, sorry, I'm like snotting everywhere. I'm disgusting. <laughs> um, and, and then we'd sing along to Nora Jones in the kitchen and Zanny would always, like Camelia said, she'd hit the line just after, just after the track. So, you know, wait until I saw the sun, wait until I saw the sun. <laughs> And she'd look at your face and really hold your face and hold your gaze while she was doing it. It was like a little weird, but we all loved it. <laughs> Each morning when we were little, we'd wake up early so that we could try to rush up to Zanny and Zeta's room. And we'd sit in bed and we'd watch, uh, we'd watch reruns of Three's Company. Thank you. We'd watch reruns of Three's Company and sit at the foot of Zanny's vanity and we'd play with her Shui Umera concealer stick while she did her makeup. 
and <laughs> and then we'd go into her closet and it was this beautiful fantasy land and all color coded and and jewelry dripping off of off of these beautiful intricate picture frames with pictures of all of us in them and the cats would walk around ominously and then lay in their luxurious fur splendor Chrissy Betty Gloria they had great lives still do Gloria's still kicking it uh, <laughs> so, you know, in this fantasy land known as Zanny's Closet, there were no rules. Growing up as a young woman, you get a lot of different types of messages about how to be. You know, be beautiful, but don't be vain, and, and care about how you look, but don't be a prima donna, and be sexy, but not too sexy. In Zanny's Closet, no rules, okay? She taught us, she loved being a woman, and she taught us to enjoy feminine pleasures, to enjoy the luxuries of life. Lalique vases, Baccarat glasses, all these beautiful things it, it was all for our enjoyment and you know if you work hard in life if you follow your dreams you can achieve this the life you want you can achieve your dreams and she surely had my favorite game was when she let us play dress up in her closet and she did this with complete and utter abandon which is says a lot because you know you can only imagine the type of of clothing and jewelry and accessories she had she said go crazy you know so we would put together all these outfits and then she'd say oh look at you oh oh you my darling granddaughter oh i never thought to put that together oh <laughs> I remember Camelia and I, we'd dance around in her closet and, and do these little dances and whatever, and she could only tell us how perfect we were at all times. And, and she told us how perfect we were and how cute our little bodies were and how we should always feel really good in our skin. And we should always um, accept ourselves and love who we are. And Camelia jokingly pushed up her boobs, what little was there at the time. <laughs> and Zanny said, great. If you've got it, flaunt it, <laughs> which is very different advice than you often hear as a young woman growing up. For weekend sleepovers at Zanny's house, we would open a recipe book and choose something to make. We made everything. We made ginger snaps, lemon tarts, pumpkin surprise at Thanksgiving. Uh, you know, I made souffles with Zanny, and I remember she said, whatever the recipe says, always use extra egg whites add extra. I said, okay, how many? Uh, just a few. I counted and she added nine extra egg whites to her souffle. <laughs> and she taught me how to wrap, wrap up the mannequin with parchment and, um, and a little tie so that the souffle could rise extra high. One day she said to me around my birthday, she said, Violet, I had a dream of the type of cake I'm going to make you for your birthday. And it was a regular butter cake with frosting and uh, we went out to the garden and we painted leaves, real leaves with melted chocolate. And then we froze the leaves and peeled off the actual leaf part and you had all these beautiful chocolate leaves. We stuck them into the cake and it was this beautiful flower. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, she had this dream and she made it a reality. I don't think that was something new for her. <laughs> As I grew into a young teen, Instead of asking me boring, impersonal questions like, how's school? Awful, always. She would start a conversation by asking, Violet, what do you want to be in life? Or are you in love with anybody? She supported me when I was chronically ill by proximity to the most incredible integrative medicine doctors. When I was struggling to make friends, her advice was, yeah, fuck them. <laughs> when I was failing school, she'd say to me, School doesn't really matter. What are your dreams? And I would ramble on for as long as she'd let me. You can do it, she'd say. And she believed it. We imagined my life as a pastry chef when I was seven, editor-in-chief of Vogue when I was 12, <laughs> Alexander McQueen when I was in university studying fashion design. <laughs> These days, I like to imagine she's on my shoulder cheering on my writing career. She encouraged me to dream, dream big because I can achieve what I want in this life, and we all can. I speak of this now to remind myself and all of us who have been so afflicted and hardened by the talons of reality that if little Susie Mahoney, who cried in her closet night after night, who stuffed her bras, made paper dolls, 
and sang proudly in choir. If she, battered and beaten from her defenseless childhood, could dream of one day having a swimming pool, jewelry to wear to parties, a husband to dote on, a big family, and a successful career as a famous actress, author, performer, business owner. If she could make that dream come true, no bite is too big for any of us to chew. And I know she's cheering each of us on, dreaming with us, and on wonderful nights, she visits me in my dreams. The possibilities are never ending. Thank you, Zanny, for everything and all that I will never be able to touch with words. A little um, side note on the uh, Johnny Carson, her first appearance. I was seven years old when she got that, uh, that opportunity. And uh, so I was up in San Francisco staying with friends and my bedtime was 8.30, so they put me to bed. And then they woke me up because my mother was going to be on The Tonight Show. And uh, she comes out and all I was thinking is, my mother is so excited about this. This is such an amazing thing for her. But I'm sure no one's up right now watching this. <laughs> so life of a seven-year-old. Uh, um, everything you saw there was, yes, it was my mother, but it was really a partnership between Alan and my mother. None of that could have happened without Alan. Alan was always working in the background so that my mother could be creative. Yay, Alan. <laughs> um, he had not just one, but two significant women in his life. And I think one of the greatest decisions he made was hiring my wife to be the president of his company. So with that, I want to introduce Caroline Summers. Hi, everyone. Wow, what a badass, huh? I mean, I'm so in awe of this woman. I always have been since I, since I met her um, at Bruce's 21st birthday party, and she likes to say that she picked me to be his, his wife. Yeah. Um, lucky me. Lucky me that that, was, um, that that was my good fortune. You know, of all of these amazing careers that Suzanne had, and we've, we've We've seen them. I think she had five careers that you would have, you would have ended a life and thought I did really well with any one of those five careers, but it really wasn't her greatest accomplishment. I really her greatest accomplishment was how she made us all feel, and it was being the matriarch of our family and the love that she gave to all of us. Um, when you see people who have been that successful, very often their family doesn't have that feeling that they usually missed out. And Suzanne somehow would literally tap dance off stage and make duck a l'orange. And it just felt effortless. <laughs> and that really was um, who she was. She, she gave so much love and she healed all of my wounds from losing my mother when I was a little girl. And she always said, I'm going to be your earth mother. And she was. She And she was for all of us. And it's such a special gift that she had. There is nothing as powerful as a mother's love. And she filled us, she filled us all up and made us whole. Um, her mommy chicken dinner is the best thing you'll ever eat. And she was so glamorous while doing it all. Um, I remember when we got engaged and she threw that beautiful engagement dinner for us. And she had this beautiful swan and it was filled with orchids and she made lamb chops on croute with lavender honey and then she brought out a baked Alaska flambe which she had made at the end and that was like the special quality she had of cooking and hosting and entertaining and if you were lucky enough to share a meal at her home you know just how special it was she over the course of my life taught me all those things she taught me the techniques and she taught me about ingredients and we, she traveled with me and she expanded my life in so many ways. And I am such a grateful recipient for all the things that she taught me. Um, she also saw my potential before I did, you know, like Leslie was saying, she, she kind of pulled us out very young and just said, you would be good at this. And she was right. 
And I think she saw our potential even before we did. Um, our family grew, our business grew, and it all wove together so beautifully. Um, and then we added these millions of followers who also feel like family to us and still continue to feel like family. Um, our business model was pretty easy. It was take something that Suzanne has or something that she does in her lifestyle and replicate it for people at home. And I remember being at Home Shopping Network and I was like, hmm, God, she makes such a good beef bourguignon. And before you knew it, we sold 25,000 slow cookers and 75,000 jars of beef bourguignon sauce. And she'd look at her ladies and she'd say, shine your lights. You can do this. You can make this. And she was so amazing at building self-esteem. And it's what she did for us and our family. But it's also what she did for all of her ladies was like telling you about your potential and not to let those negative voices in your head. And... I really feel like that's how she spread her love in the world. And yes, it was through products and it was through entertaining, but really her goal here was to share her love and to share her light. And God, you succeeded. Um, I wanna thank you, Suzanne, for, for sharing your painful journey as a child and for showing us, you know, that she shared that journey of being the child of an alcoholic when celebrities, it wasn't cool to share, you were supposed to be a perfect, perfect person. And she, by sharing those wounds, um, she helped millions of people. She gave them hope and she gave them, she lit a path to say there is a way to get beyond childhood trauma. And I thank you for that. Um, I thank you for asking for equal pay for women. Um, you deserved it. Uh, that equal pay came later for women, and we're still making progress, but she cracked that ceiling. Um, I want to thank you for educating millions of people about bioidentical hormones, and I'll, I'll never forget when she looked at me one day and she said, Ugh, I don't want to be the menopause poster girl. <laughs> but you know what? She, she knew women needed better, and she found the way, and she made aging aspirational. And I was actually at my gynecologist's office this month and he, you know, he looked at me and he said, oh, he said, I have to tell you, Suzanne did more for women's health than any of us. Any doctor, any author, Suzanne made the biggest impact on women's health. And I thought, wow, for like one of the top doctors in the field to say that about Suzanne, she had a voice and she used it and she, she put out a lot of good information. Um, I want, also want to thank her for being such a powerful and smart sex symbol and for being sex positive. She shattered all of the stereotypes about dumb blondes and beautiful women. She was brilliant and she just kept writing it and proving it over and over. And I was so happy to see that she finally got to that place where she had such respect as a health and wellness expert. Um, mostly, I just want to thank I just want to thank you for your wit and all those belly laughs and the number of times you picked up the phone and all the guidance and all the caring. Um, and I could, I could miss her, but she literally knit herself so into the fabric of my life that she is, I feel her with me always. I, I wake up in the morning and I look at my husband and I see her kind, beautiful eyes. <laughs> And I hear Camellia sing a Broadway tune and I, I hear her voice and I look at Violet and those Mahoney lips of yours and I hear her goofy laugh. Like I feel her around me always. And whenever I have questions in business, I already know the answers because it was, it was all there. And that's because she just literally knit herself into my soul and I feel so lucky for that. So uh, we will continue to rally around Alan. I know that was her her most important thing that she was worried about was making sure that Alan was taken care of. We as a family have been rallying around him. I will tell you, he's ready to be social now. Reach out to Alan, guys, as his friends. He is ready to pick him up, though. Pick him up and drive him to where you're going. <laughs> he's not going to let you, but he's, he is ready to be social. Um, we're going to continue playing your music, Suzanne, and singing your songs and running your business and making your incredible soup. You are the most badass woman I have ever known, and no one will ever replace you, but we will carry on your legacy. I love you.
So now, at one of the most amazing accomplishments of my mother is nothing to do with her career. It's the family that she put together. So I'm going to introduce my brother. Uh, um, I have a brother and a sister, and uh, we've known each other since we were five. So we don't recognize bloodlines. We are a family. So with that, Stephen Hamill. Uh, it was astonishing to watch them, actually, from when I was a little boy and see them become what they became. It's really inspirational, I have to say, um, and continues to be. I wrote something down because uh, um, I was so many things that I wanted to potentially speak about, but um, anyways, I'll read it. Uh, there are vast expressions of memories and emotions when I think about Suzanne. But the one thing that stands out to me was her profound expression of love for Alan, and of course, his profound love for her. Their love was not just a partnership. It was a cosmic alignment of two people destined to find each other in the vast expanse of life. In the truest sense of the word, they were a soulmates, two beings connected on a level <clears throat> that goes beyond the physical, beyond the temporal, and beyond any constraints. It's a love that transcended distance and time and circumstance, creating a bond that remains unbroken even in the face of loss. Uh, really a supernatural love. Uh, and, uh, you know, I loved Suzanne, and I think maybe we all did in our own way. And I think it would be nice if we all said at the same time, we love you, Suzanne. One, two, three. We love you, Suzanne. Thank you. Okay. Hey, you guys. I wasn't going to speak tonight because I felt that I would break down and be like Roman in succession, where I <laughs> got there and I thought I was like, I had it together, and then break down crying. But, and I might, I might. Um, I just like, Suzanne and I had a bond through style, through pretty much everything in our lives that was intense and beautiful and cool. First of all, Suzanne was fucking cool. <laughs> if you don't know, <laughs> she was. She was the hippest girl ever. Um, when I was still in school, she asked me to design an outfit for her to wear on the cover of Playboy, which was crazy because I hadn't done anything yet. And anyway, it got made and she wore it on the cover of Playboy. And when, once, I, once I graduated from design school, I continued to design her Vegas costumes and her red carpet and her everything. And I'm not trying to list off my credits, but this was our bond, was everything beautiful and sexy and cool. We also, we're really good at fighting with each other. <laughs> she felt cool to fight with me, and I felt cool to fight with her. But by the end of the day, it was always like, are you mad? No, I'm not mad anymore. OK, cool. I love you. I love you, too. So that was kind of like our relationship. It was just like very um, easy. And I, I hate being here and speaking about her in the past because, because I feel like she's with me and I feel her presence with me all the time and I don't want that feeling to go away. So, Suzanne, I love you and you're here and you are not fucking leaving me. <laughs> but I do fucking love Suzanne with all my heart. I love her and my dad's love story. I love our whole family, all our, our traditions and, okay, now I'm breaking down. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
and that was my sister Leslie. <laughs> and another, uh, another reason that I am a proud uncle is because of Daisy Hamill Bufa. Uh, um, there are some beautiful voices in this family, and I want you to hear another one. Hello. Oh, thank you. I'm not really a speaker because I won't be able to handle it, but my Zanny obviously taught me so much about music and singing and love and jazz. And I feel like every time I sing, she'll always be with me. So thanks. So my Uncle Dan is going to give us a couple words and uh, tell you a little about his baby sister. She was talented from day one. We didn't have much. We had a piano in our living room and we had a, an old Munch TV that had a record player. And Suzanne would sing those songs and spin in circles for hours and hours and hours. And I go, Mom, something's wrong with her. <laughs> she started a cappuccino and there she was in dramatics class and she starred in Guys and Dolls. Walter Winchell was there that night. He saw her and he said, she's a budding star. But the beautiful voice you hear from Suzanne, I've heard that since I was seven years old. Suzanne has been like our pride and joy. So now um, I'm not just a proud son, but I'm also a very proud uncle. Uh, um, and one of the reasons why is because Zion Hamill is here to give another toast. So my nephew, Zion Hamill. Hello, everyone. I love that we're outside tonight here in the mountains. We've been, uh, as a family, spending a lot of time outside with Zeta in his beautiful new home. Um, and every time we see a hummingbird or a butterfly or a bighorn, we think it's Zanny. So if you see one tonight, it's definitely her. Uh, reflecting on all the stories that I could share about Zanny, I thought about why not tell the one that she told me the most. As our family does, we tend to find ourselves elbow to elbow around the dinner table. Zanny was always the first to speak, expressing her gratitude and making sure to acknowledge everyone in the room. When it came around to me, she would tell the same story of when she first met me as a baby in Paris, how I loved that she sang to me, and she would come into my bedroom and we would sing the same song. And then she would always say, and you might remember, but I'll just sing a bar or so. Am I blue, am I blue, all these dreams in my heart loving you. Then would come another, remember? Of course I didn't remember, I was just a newborn. But I knew her story word for word, as did the whole family all thinking, here goes Zanny again. It wasn't until recently that I discovered the song in its entirety and realized that Zanny completely changed the lyrics. She made it her own. A song that was about heartbreak and loneliness became about dreams and love. The last time she told the story was when my brothers and I got bar mitzvah together a few years ago. I know she loved sneaking in the opportunity to sing there, though the truth is I was selfishly the one taking pride in her singing to me as my friends looked on in awe. As she said, she was a different kind of grandma. While Zanny's not here with her words, I still feel the melody that she made of life. She taught me to make life a song, to love what you do, and especially the people that you do it with. To our family, I like to think that Zanny shaped us into a different type of family, in that same indescribable way that she transcended any labels. I am blue today, but a Zanny kind of blue. Thank you. Please give her one last standing ovation. Hello guys, I welcome you to my channel Nice Nivon. So on November 30th, 2023, Susan Summer's legacy was honored by her loved ones in a celebration of life. The event was planned by her son Bruce Summers Jr. and her daughter-in-law Caroline Summers and it took place at Stone Eagle Club in Palm Desert. 
The filmed celebration, Tequila and Tributes, featured a colorful cocktail attire with sparkles and feathers in true Susan fashion. The memorial services invitation and program showcased a beautiful illustration of Susan. Tables were filled with Susan's signature pink roses, and guests received parting gifts including a holiday candle from her fragrance line and a love bracelet. Bruce acted as the master of ceremonies, guiding guests through an hour-long program filled with family toasts, performances, and heartfelt tributes. The evening left many guests, moved to tears from the touching tributes, and Alani's concluding remarks marked a beautiful and authentic tribute to Susan. The event was filled with songs and heart-stopping videos of Susan, creating a moving and heartfelt atmosphere. Susan Summers passed away on October 15, 2023, at the age of 76, one day before her 77th birthday after her battle with breast cancer. May her soul rest in peace.